I'm really sorry I can't see all you guys over there. Good morning, good morning. We're just going to go ahead and get started. Um, uh, we're very excited to be here. We're very excited you are here uh, to hear about uh, the, the new national initiative and this. We're going to introduce you to a, a national guide that is like really hot off the press if it were printed. It just got posted uh, the other day. And we want to uh, thank the live streaming audience, too, for being with us. We also want to thank the State Justice Institute. They have been funding, they just started funding a three-year national initiative to improve the court and community response to those with mental illness. And it has the support of the Conference of Chief Justices, the Conference of State Court Administrators, the National Center for State Courts, and very importantly, National Association for Court Management is a key partner in all of the work uh, that we're going to accomplish together uh, moving forward. It's brand new and we're getting a, off to a fast start. And I want to thank my colleagues, uh, Nicole Waters and Yolanda Lewis. Uh, these are two wonderful people to share with you not only the work of the National Guide and uh, some uh, resources that are now available on the website, but Yolanda is going to share her story uh, in Georgia. This work that we have before us is going to have to occur state by state, community by community, and it is going to take each and every one of us working very hard and probably for a very long time. Uh, so uh, I'm going to get right to it, and we're going to share some uh, problems, and we're going to share some solutions for you. So to set the context, just want to talk briefly about what, 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 what is the landscape? 83.2 million cases were filed in state courts in 2017. We don't yet know the number of those cases in which a party or the defendant has a mental illness. But I think we all can agree that there are too many that are filed in our courts involving a person with a mental illness and or a serious mental illness. Think about your court, wherever you are, whatever your community looks like, are you seeing an increasing number of people with mental illness appearing in your courtrooms? Yes. <laughs> are you seeing an increasing number of people languishing in your jails? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, are you experiencing any delays in competency proceedings, in fitness to proceed? They're called all sorts of things across the nation. But are you experiencing, like so many others, problems in that area? Or in getting the evaluation? Or in getting a, a person to restoration treatment and services? What about on the civil side? Are you seeing an increasing number of civil commitments? Whatever your process is, are you seeing an increasing number? Do you know what's happening in, with those cases? I didn't know. I, I mean, I've been in the courts forever. I didn't know what was happening with those cases. Um, how long is it taking for someone to actually get committed, to get a hospital bed for a, a civil inpatient commitment? What happens after they get released? Is your court involved in that? Do you know what happens? Is it a revolving door like it is in many jurisdictions? What about, what about the uh, situation on a civil commitment, someone is taken into a, a hospital or an emergency room. What about, have you heard about psychiatric boarding? What's happening on some of these civil uh, processes, if someone's going to go into the hospital for treatment, there's not a bed available. They wait on a gurney for a bed. Um, 
Do you know what's happening, again, in your court and in your community? For one, I did not know. And as I said, I've, I've worked in many states and been you know, really involved in this, um, or in court administration as a NACA member and as a state court administrator. I didn't know what was happening. Do you see what's happening in the child welfare cases? Uh, in how many parents don't have access to treatment? The kids are taken away because there might be a, a mental health problem. Um, or in juvenile delinquency cases. You know, we're going to be talking mostly about adults today, but this is true for all of our populations that we deal with. In the family law area, uh, mental illness is impacting uh, cases that are coming into our courts and coming in again and again. 83.2 million. We've got a few, a little work to do. On the mental health side, we have the estimate is 46.6 million in a year experience a mental illness. That's one out of five adults <laughs> in this room. What does that mean in terms of the numbers of us uh, with a mental, that experience a mental illness that year? Think about the impact that has um, in, of course, our courtrooms, in our courthouses, in our communities, in our workplace. Think about the impact of mental illness in each of our workplace. You know, typically I'm thinking outside the community, et cetera. But we also need to be thinking about the impact of mental illness in each of our, our workplaces. And think about it in terms of your family and friends. We all just need to get a little bit smarter <laughs> about mental illness and its impact in so many areas. So not only is it 46.6 million that would experience a mental illness in a year, 11.2 million with a serious mental illness, a bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, 11.2 million, that's a lot of people. And the number that really gets me every time, 2 million people, an estimated 2 million people with a serious mental illness are arrested and jailed throughout the nation. Everybody, I think, agrees, if you think about it, that we have a public health crisis. And that public health crisis is we're not connecting people with treatment. Um, and there's a whole lot of reasons for that. The default in so many of our communities is with the court system. It's with the criminal justice system. And we're not equipped, my premise is we are not equipped, or certainly we're not the best equipped to deal with the increasing number of people with serious mental illness that are, are being filed in our courts and that are landing in our jails. So, Today, I want you to climb the mountain with me. We want to motivate you to start thinking about what you can do in your courthouse, what you can do in your community. We're going to provide you some tools, and we've got some new resources, and there's going to be lots more coming down the road. So uh, we really hope that you'll come with us on this journey. It's a long, hard journey. It's not like you can go back and take that one idea and fix things. It's a long, hard journey. And as I mentioned, it's going to require each of us state by state, but community by community, no matter what size community you live in, no matter what size court you work in, it's going to take all of us to move forward. So uh, last week, I, so I live in Colorado. Last week, my daughter and I climbed what they call a 14er. And uh, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, in one of those pictures, you can see the summit. Now, it might not look like it's really far away, but that is one, <laughs> that is one long summit up there, OK? That's where we want you to go. When people with mental illness are connected to treatment, that's the summit. That's where we're trying to reach. And uh, 
we don't want them just arrested and taken to jail and languished to jail. The summit that we need to reach is treatment, access to treatment early on before the crisis occurs. And that's what we'll share with you, some uh, ways to go with that. I had a family member involved in one of those 83.2 million cases. Our justice system failed him. My daughter didn't think I could make it to the summit. But you can see <laughs> 14,000 265 feet. We made it to the summit, and I need each of you, whoa, to help all of us uh, make it to the summit. I need all court leaders to be involved and to help us get to that summit where we can deal with this public health crisis where it belongs in the public health system and that we're not dealing with it at the back end uh, in our courts throughout the, throughout the nation. I was thinking of a quote uh, that's uh, very meaningful to me. Martin Luther King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And that really seems like a good mantra, at least it's my mantra, uh, going forward. So to get started, um, we're, the, the place where we believe, the basic premise that we believe is important is judicial leadership, is court leadership. And so I thought no better place to start than Judge Steve Leifman from Miami-Dade County. Judge Leifman's gonna help us as part of the national initiative. Thanks, Jonathan, I, I recognized and thanked you uh, earlier on. Um, for the support of the SJI. But Judge Leifman embodies the kind of judicial leadership that we need to see throughout the nation, again, state by state, community by community. And I'd just like to share this video with you of what one person can do uh, in Miami, and he did it in Miami-Dade County. Good morning, Judge Alejandro Aristizado at the Jail Diversion Program. On Mr. Dolan's case, the state approved his participation in diversion. We would like to request, Your Honor, transfer the case to our mental health court. Anything else? That's all. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Thank you Judge. Have a good day. Good. How are you doing, man? Good, man. Okay. If you're going to put in your half and work with us, okay. all right, and we'll work with you the whole year. All right, all right take care. Last year, about 1.5 million people with serious mental illnesses were arrested. It's foolhardy what we do now, it's dangerous what we do now, and it's cruel because we're not really affording people the opportunity for recovery. Good morning, go ahead and show me 09, radio 4239 Alpha. The plan was assaulted by her mentally ill daughter, it's still on the scene, 721. 97 people, primarily diagnosed with schizophrenia, cost taxpayers almost $13 million, and we got absolutely nothing for it. I get into jail, I'm laying in a pile of feces, vomit, and urine. There was people screaming around the clock, people being beat down. All right, good morning, I'm Judge Leifman. You may be seated. He says we can do it, and we believe him. We have this amazing program with amazing people that could help keep you out of here. And I'd like to do that. We are doing our best, Judge, to get him to a hospital to get stabilized. It was the definition of insanity, where we kept doing the same thing again and again and expecting a different outcome. So now we have a totally different system. As resources become limited, we have to be able to identify which people need the services the most. Trevor, 
He's engaging in uh, work. Maybe he's trying to see if he's going to do deliveries with a wine company. Not sure if that's <laughs> the best, but it is a job. <laughs> it may be good if Justin, you're going to do follow-up to touch base with him before he comes back. Judge on page 30 and 31, Charlie Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez, how are you? Pretty good. Jail diversion is not your regular route through the system. What the state attorney's office will do is come up with what we call a diversion offer. Hey, what's the offer? Is it a withhold? Is it an adjudication? Is it a null process? So I think it's a null process. If you participate in jail diversion and you are successful throughout these 12 months, that we are going to dismiss your charges. And that's huge. Collaboration in the criminal justice system is not a natural act. And so it had to be created. So the courts, the prosecutors, the correction folks, the defense attorneys, the defense, we have to say to ourselves, what is the best outcome for this particular individual and the community at the same time? Yeah, I know you've been doing consistently very well since the beginning. You want me to take you off the monitor? Yes. It's a very different role for judges. You definitely have to believe in rehabilitation. You have to believe in redemption. Oh man, my ankle feels a little lighter. <laughs> somebody is identified at the jail meeting criteria, we offer them the opportunity to come into our program. They get taken directly from the facility right to the courtroom, where a peer is waiting for them. Hey, Yuri. What's up, brother? Are you hungry? Yeah, I'm hungry. All right, we're going to get something to eat. The harder part is developing the system of care in the community, because some of it didn't even exist. And there are other things that people need other than just their treatment for their particular illness. It's making sure that these individuals get all the supports, all the treatments that they need to actually help them recover. I wanted to know if this is my life in a nutshell from here forward. This is the process. You have to continue with treatment. You have to take your meds. The organizational skills you have is what will keep you mentally sharp. Preparation. And preparation. He's really coming with it. I mean, he's bringing the words today. So it has taken an enormous level of collaboration on many, many levels to make this actual system work. The case is gonna be over at some point, but we wanna make sure we had the impact on your life where we left you well off and better than when we found you in jail. Getting you to start working, if you have an opportunity, do it. I want to impress everybody. I was just in a bad place at a bad, bad time and it made me do things. And... We have to really prepare so that That's we don't right. have to go back to we the drink, we can call. the drug, or jail. Trevor, he's about the same age Justin was when we worked on getting Justin out of jail and into treatment. Alejandro met me in a psychiatric unit at Jackson Memorial Hospital. Justin wasn't easy to work with. I was very sick. I told him, what did I tell him? Al-Qaeda was on Miami Beach. Do you remember that one? I went to program, I started taking my meds. Oh, I closed out my court case, they offered me a job. <laughs> I'm in recovery. Yes. Well, like, what was good? Drugs, alcohol, mental health. I went from having an open felony to becoming a county employee eight months later. And it doesn't happen. President Kennedy, his last public signing was to create this national community mental health system. But not one dollar got appropriated because he was assassinated. All right, Charlie, you are in a home stretch. Sometimes at the tail end, when people see the finish line, they go off the rails. So I want you to finish strong. We now have over 6,000 police officers trained in what's called crisis intervention team policing. Let me see the medication. No, 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 I don't want to go. We're here to help you out. So many men just end up dying in this house, and nobody even knows. We know how to fix it. It's a question of political will, and it's a question of leadership. The stigma and ignorance is everywhere. So Trevor came back positive from alcohol. What's he facing? I have approximately 45 years state prison. You understand that, Trevor? You have 45 years where you're facing. She's sitting with a patient who's going to UM crisis. So we don't have time to wait. You see how you can look picture perfect. And then all of a sudden, within a minute, everything has just collapsed. Oh, oh. Give him a seat. Hurry up. Give him a seat. So my new quote is, those who keep trying can never be defeated. <laughs> Just gonna keep chucking away. You proud of yourself, we're proud of you. Congratulations. When you see somebody come in and they're really sick and then and they have hope again. And I think that is the best definition of justice that you will ever get.
the website that I mentioned, um, what I wanted to talk about is that the leading change is the national guide, and this is something that will help you get started. But it's not just for people who are getting started, but it's for, for people at all different stages. Um, oftentimes you hear the phrase, how to eat an elephant, and you eat one bite at a time, right? Um, that is one way to approach it, but it's also really key to when you're facing this really large task to be able to get to that summit. You need to approach it with a team of individuals who have a shared vision. When they have a shared vision, you can really accomplish a lot when you bring people to the table. You don't have to do this alone. You do not have to go at it alone. Um, so it's for all sorts of different people. Um, if you click on the leading change, you will see um, the guide that we're talking about, the leading change, improving the court and community's responses to mental health and co-occurring disorders. Um, this guide will be useful for people who have started who have stumbled, who have regrouped, for so those who have done some pieces, go, maybe worked on one of the areas, but not really comprehensively looking at it. Um, and also some people who may have done this effort maybe five years ago and you're starting to think, how do I sustain the change? And so here's a table of contents of what it is containing. There's lots of ways to get started, to convene stakeholders. Our main goal is that we really wanted to make this a very practical guide. So we've included all sorts of pieces in here that will be helpful for you. We've included checklists, sample agendas that you can utilize. Uh, we have a list of potential stakeholders in there, and that has been growing as we go. So if you have any new ideas, please share those with us. Um, you know, there's benefits providers, there's housing um, specialists, there's people who have lived experiences, lots of different people that you may not have thought about, including into your stakeholder uh, list. And so check out all of those different practical pieces of the guide when you're looking at this. Um, so let me go here to the website. And hopefully this one will work. So the coordinated um, court and community responses, as I explained, it's based on the sequential intercept model, but it is expanded from that. Oh, and that's not showing either, is it? Could you help us? <laughs> David, please <coughs> Can I get that to display? Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's an expanded screen. Thank you. And so when we look at this, you can click on each of these different pieces that we've added, and it brings you down, and you can look at all sorts of um, different components. And each of these then will expand to give you a definition, a description of it. Um, so this is the continuity of care. And then as you can see, it goes down here, and you have um, a, some resources and some links. And our plan is to really expand this and build out all of these different resources that you can um, tap into. So there's the continuity of care. There's also um, like a public outreach. All of these will open up and give you some resources. Um, as you scroll down the screen, there's also the sequential intercept models, which you are probably familiar with. And at each of those, there's additional resources that you can um, click on and get some information about them. So deflection, for instance, a description of that along with some national and local and state resources that can help you. Um, the, this is also something that is hot off the press. This came out just on Friday, so it is now live and take a look at that. We are planning to build this. Um, there's all sorts of great resources, but at the same time we are looking for more uh, resources to continually add to this, so we don't see this as a static product. We're hoping to build over time. Um, the other piece that I would like to show you is um, that we are doing one other piece that's not quite ready for live, but it's something that we are designing. It's an assessment tool. And the purpose of the assessment tool is to start to ask different questions. And we can ask the different questions, yes and no, as you go through the assessment tool. And at the end of it, you will find um, a way to identify maybe where some of your areas of uh, priority should be, where you want to start, 
It'll help to get people thinking about what is their status, where are they in their community, what types of resources would be helpful at that stage. And so at the end of it, it will provide you with priority resources and areas to focus on. And it'll link to a lot of the resources that are on that other web page that I just showed you, um, but with more of a tailored look at your assessment tool. So I think that we can um, quickly go back to the, the video. Do we have time for that? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. OK. So again, this is uh, Judge Leifman, judicial leadership. Morning, Judge Alejandro Aristizal at the Jail Diversion Program. On Mr. Dolan's case, the state approved his participation in diversion. We would like to request, Your Honor, transfer the case to our mental health court. Anything else? That's all. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Judge. Good, man. Okay. If you're gonna put in your half and work with us, okay. all right, okay. and we'll work with you the whole year. All right, all right. take care. Last year, about 1.5 million people with serious mental illnesses were arrested. It's foolhardy what we do now, it's dangerous what we do now, and it's cruel because we're not really affording people the opportunity for recovery. Good morning, go ahead and show me 09, radio 4239 Alpha. The plan was assaulted by her mentally ill daughter. It's still on the scene, 721. 97 people primarily diagnosed with schizophrenia cost taxpayers almost $13 million, and we got absolutely nothing for it. I get into jail, I'm laying in a pile of feces, vomit, and urine. There was people screaming around the clock, people being beat down. All right, good morning, I'm Judge Lifeman. You may be seated. He says we can do it, and we believe him. We have this amazing program with amazing people that could help keep you out of here. And I'd like to do that. We are doing our best, Judge, to get him to a hospital to get stabilized. It was a definition of insanity, where we kept doing the same thing again and again and expecting a different outcome. So now we have a totally different system. As resources become limited, we have to be able to identify which people need the services the most. Trevor, he's engaging in uh, work. Maybe he's trying to see if he's going to do deliveries with a wine company. Sure, that's <laughs> the best, but it is a job. <laughs> it may be good if Justin, you're going to do follow-up to touch base with him before he comes back. Judge on page 30 and 31, Charlie Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez, how are you? Pretty good, yourself, yeah. Jail diversion is not your regular route through the system. What the state attorney's office will do is come up with what we call a diversion offer. Hey, hey. what's the offer? Is it a withhold? Is it an adjudication? Is it a null process? So I think it's a null process. If you participate in jail diversion and you are successful throughout these 12 months, that we are going to dismiss your charges. And that's huge. Collaboration in the criminal justice system is not a natural act. And so it had to be created. So the courts, the prosecutors, the correction judge, folks, the defense the attorneys, the defense, program. we have to say to ourselves, what is case, the best the outcome for in diversion, this particular individual would like and the community at the same time? Thank you, Judge. Do you want me to take you off the monitor? Yes. It's a very different role for judges. You definitely have to believe in rehabilitation. You have to believe in redemption. What's the offer? Is it a withhold? Is it an adjudication? Is it a null process? So I think it's a null process. If you participate in jail diversion and you are successful throughout these 12 months, that we are going to dismiss your charges. And that's huge. 
collaboration in the criminal justice system is not a natural act. And so it had to be created. So the courts, the prosecutors, the correction folks, the defense attorneys, the defense, we have to say to ourselves, what is the best outcome for this particular individual and the community at the same time? Yeah, I know you've been doing consistently very well since the beginning. Do you want me to take you off the monitor? Yes, ma'am. Yes. It's a very different role for judges. You definitely have to believe in rehabilitation. You have to believe in redemption. Oh, man, my ankle feels a little lighter. <laughs> Somebody is identified at the jail meeting criteria, and we offer them the opportunity to come into our program. They get taken directly from the facility right to the courtroom, where a peer is waiting for them. Hey, you are? What's up, brother? Are you hungry? Yeah, I'm hungry. Yeah, we're going to get something to eat. The harder part is developing the system of care in the community, because some of it didn't even exist. And there are other things that people need other than just their treatment for their particular illness. It's making sure that these individuals get all the supports, all the treatments that they need to actually help them recover. I want to know if this is my life in a nutshell from here forward. This is the process. You have to continue with treatment. You have to take your meds. The organizational skills you have is what will keep you mentally sharp. Preparation. And preparation. He's really coming. I mean, he's bringing the words today. So it has taken an enormous level of collaboration on many, many levels to make this actual system work. The case is going to be over at some point, but we want to make sure we have the impact on your life where we left you well off. On Mr. Jones' case, the state approved his participation in diversion. You have an opportunity. We would like to request your honor to transfer the case to our mental health court. I was just in a bad place at a bad time. It's all thank you, Judge. We have to really prepare so that we don't have to go back to the drink, the drug, Put your forever. Forever. He's about the same age Justin was when we worked on getting Justin out of jail and into treatment. Alejandro met me last year at about 1.5 million people. Hospital. Serious mental Justin wasn't arrested. easy to work with. I was very sick. I told him, what did I tell him? Al Qaeda was on my Amy Beach. Do you remember that one? I went to program, it's I started taking my meds. Now. It's so dangerous I what my court we do case now, and it's cool because job. we're not really affording people the opportunity for recovery. Good morning, go ahead and show me 09, Gradio 4239 Alpha. People was sponsored by her mentally ill daughter, Michelle McBee, 721. 97 people, primarily diagnosed with schizophrenia, cost taxpayers almost $13 million, and we got absolutely nothing for it. I get into jail, I'm laying in a pile of feces, vomit, and urine. There was people screaming around the clock, people being beat down. We're gonna stop. All right, good Let's morning, Judge Life, and you may be seated. He says we can do it, and we believe him. We have this amazing program with amazing people that could help keep you out of here. And I'd like to. Sorry, <laughs> it didn't quite work, but we'll go ahead and try and post that so that you can watch it on your own. Uh, Judge Leifman uh, indicated we could, uh, again, share it with you. If you'll go back to the PowerPoint slides, what we'd like to do now is have um, Yolanda Lewis uh, share with us what she was able to accomplish in her community working with all of the stakeholders. And it's a wonderful story, and uh, they've done a wonderful job. And we're so pleased to have Yolanda with us. How are you? No video. <laughs> Thank you. Keep going. There you go. Whoop. There you go. Thank you. Um, go good morning. Is it still morning? In Atlanta, it's in the afternoon, so I'm a little bit off um, being here. So uh, I'm Yolanda Lewis. I'm the district court administrator for the Atlanta Judicial Circuit um, back in Fulton County and in Georgia. And I would love to say that I'm here to kind of tell you what I got accomplished. Uh, it wasn't me at all. I have so many colleagues that are in this room from Fulton County, and I hate to put them on the spot, but if you're from Fulton County, would you just please stand up for me just <laughs> one quick second? I know you're here, and I know it's embarrassing. <laughs> it's like church. 
it's, it's like when you go to church and uh, the, they tell you to stand up and you get really nervous about it because you don't want them to ask you to say something. Um, and so I, I come on behalf of them and so many other folks in Fulton County, particularly our judges and our county commissioners who have made this a really, really big issue. Um, and I'm so excited to be here with all of you because I think you're in this room because you've joined this fight um, because we believe we can do better for the people who are coming into our courts. Uh, we believe that they are human and we must humanize this issue of mental health um, and not use incarceration as a tool to manage it. And so I'm so glad to be here with you today. So let's talk about the numbers. Let me paint a quick picture for you in Fulton County. And it's very close to the picture that was painted in Miami, so I won't go into the details. I'll just paint the numbers for you. So in Fulton County, we are a population of about a million people. Um, we have every day, uh, in, over the course of a year, there's about 32,000 people who come into our jail. They're incarcerated, and we bring them in. Um, our daily census is about 3,100 people in a jail that is set up to hold 2,800. I want you to pay attention to the numbers, okay? So of those 3,100 people that are there, 40 to 60% of them have mental health issues. 40 to 60% of them have mental health issues. 77% of them have been there more than two times, more than two times. Of that 40 to 60% I just mentioned, 12 to 14 percent of them are on some type of psych psychotropic medication. Starting to make sense now? A lot of people, a lot of issues, and we're managing it in our jail. So our partnering hospital, um, which is Grady Hospital, which is very close to uh, within a five mile radius of the courthouse and the jail, they come into contact with about 875 people um, each, each month that need mental health treatment. 20% of those come from law enforcement contacts or either the Fulton County Jail. And so if they are not in our jail, we're taking them down the street to our hospital to manage them while we bring them back to jail. And so the picture that I'm trying to paint for you is that we were at a point of crisis. And the crisis wasn't just the court issue, it was a county issue. Because if you know anything about high utilizers, you understand that there are a number of people who are utilizing all of the infrastructures that are part of their county um, funding system, whether that is social service, medical, or the county's jail. But those high utilizers are coming back over and over again. And so when we reached a point of critical mass, we decided it was time to, to come up with a plan. So we found champions, judges, county commissioners, and court staff and, and administrators who were willing to take this issue on. So one of the very first things that we did is to really send a message to the whole entire county and to Georgia that we were serious about this issue. And so we adopted the Stepping Up Initiative. It's a very simple document. You can find it online. Everybody can um, find it very easily. But what it signified for us was a starting point in 2016. It signified that we, as a collective, county commissioners and all of the folks that were involved and the judges, were going to act on behalf in, in good faith as a collaborative partners and really try to get to the top of this issue and work our way back. So we convened what we call our Justice Mental Health Task Force. So when we started the, the uh, when we adopted the Stepping Up Initiative, we had four goals in mind, which are the same goals that are obviously um, connected to this, which is to reduce the number of people who are coming into the jail, to reduce their length of stay, to connect them to treatment, and to reduce recidivism. And so this Justice Ment and Mental Health Task Force had the goal of coming up with data-driven recommendations and an action plan to help us move forward. And part of the, one of the very first things we did, which is what we're talking about today, is we engaged in intercept mapping. Now, um, when you really get into intercept mapping, if you've done it, it looks like a, a bowl of spaghetti. It goes <laughs> everywhere, right? Everything is connected to everything. You're in the matrix. You are officially in the matrix. 
Um, but it's a sobering experience for us because we realize that while we're disconnected and we're in our courthouse, you're connected to the hospital down the street and you're connected to the social service agency and you're connected to the housing board. You're connected to everything. And so that was a really good opportunity for us to identify gaps. It was also an opportunity for us to find opportunities to work together. And so it took us about, uh, a, well, we actually engaged in it for a half day. Um, we had, as you see on the side, uh, the policy uh, research associates come in and help us manage this process. We had about 50 people there. That 50 people grew into 100 people. That 100 people grew into 150 people who are now actively engaged in our task force. Um, we had to write a grant, like most organizations. We didn't have any money to start to do this, but we wrote a grant that allowed us to do the intercept mapping and start this process. You have to have a starting point. Most of us don't have the funding to, to create that starting point, and so we had to find resources to do so. One of the other things we did with this intercept mapping process that, that you've heard from my colleagues is we found a local university is interested in this issue as well. And they helped to come in and document what we were doing and really came in as partners with us. And so the University of Georgia um, assisted us in making sure that we had a good documentation of this process and we had all of the right people at the table. Um, and, and one of the things, and I, I didn't bring the, the book up here, but um, there is a list of partners. Uh, if you'll pass it to me, I, I don't know what page it's on. There's a list of partners. This is very helpful. These are the people that we had to enlist to help us with this process. If we had had this, we would have had a, a pretty good starting point. <laughs> but we had to do it. We literally had to ask the 50 people in the room, who are we missing? And we got to the right people, but this is a great guide to help you start that process. One of the things we figured out very quickly, how many, of, how many people have a problem with data in your jurisdictions? You don't have to raise your hand. Of course you don't have a problem with data. What we realized is that we were working from estimates. Everybody had an estimate. Everybody had their own number in their own head or somewhere in the back room. But when it came time to pull it out, and make sure that we could verify the data, we realized that we had a data gap. And the 40 to 60 people, did you notice how big of a gap I mentioned? 40 to 60 people? You can't nail it down? Well, we couldn't because we were working on estimates. So when we started this process and really started to talk about data collection, you'll, you'll find this. It'll be very difficult to pull that information out. Um, and one of the, the things that we did was um, we had an opportunity to start some business cases. I want to show you what we've done, so I won't spend too much time here. But um, if you want to see the process and what we've done over the, over the couple of years that we've been working on this, um, FultonStepsUp.org is a great place. We put all of our documentation there from the first meeting agenda to our business cases. The, the business cases, though, I want to talk to you a little bit about because they were very important for us. Our business cases, uh, we have an excellent county manager who came from, the, from corporate America. None of us knew how to deal with corporate America in our courts. That's not what we're set up to do. And he kept throwing these terms around, do a business case. And we were like, what are you talking about, sir? Are you talking about like an order? We could write an order. I could have a judge <laughs> write an order. <laughs> I can have a judge have an order right now. Um, but no, he wanted a business case. And, and we had to figure out what that meant. And our business case meant that we had to identify our problem. We really had to figure out what our problems were. We had to articulate our solutions. We had to estimate the cost and the benefit to it, right? So there is a cost to incarcerating people who have mental illness. There's also a benefit not to incarcerate them. And so we had to figure that out. We had to figure out what our metrics were going to be, and then we had to have an implementation plan. And that's why we are where we are today. And so I'll tell you a little bit about those business cases and what they, um, and what they mean for us. So here we are. Uh, I think uh, Patty and Nicole talked about intercept mapping and what the intercepts look like for us. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about where we are with each one of these intercepts. So intercept zero which is community service. We started um, really kind of this process in 2018. After we did our business cases, we were then able to talk to our border commissioners and ask them for funding. Now, 
once you get through the process of mapping out everything you want to do and really bringing the right people to the table and really figuring out a plan forward, you're going to shock the people you ask for money. Okay? Don't believe me. I'm just telling you. <laughs> we asked them for $3.7 million. And they said yes. I say that only to tell you that if the problem is big enough, if you prove your case, if you go into this with strong commitment, you can make a difference and figure out how to fund this. Now they didn't give us all the 3.7 million at one time. They gave us 1.7 million, which was a halfway point for us to get started. So the first intercept that we started with was diversion. So um, very often we, we ask the police officers not to arrest individuals who have mental health issues and then they ask the question, divert to, <laughs> right, yeah. where do you want me to take them? <laughs> if I can't take them to the jail, where would you like me to take them? So one of the intercepts that we came up with was to create a pre-arrest diversion center. This is a 24 by 7 center where law enforcement can actually drop off individuals um, if they are experiencing a mental health um, crisis. Now there, it, there's going to be judgment in this and, and obviously you can't drop everyone off at this facility because if they're having a severe psych psychosis, they're going into psychosis, you have to take them to the hospital. But if I have a parent who is having an issue because their child is in the middle of a crisis and they're just acting out, this might be a really great option instead of taking them to jails. Just like all of the other county, all of the other um, states, we are, are um, our facilities, psychiatric facilities closed down and we didn't get any funding and so we're creating new facilities to try to manage that. So our goal in this is to divert about 300 individuals from um, the Fulton County Jail, but we also are taking walk-ins. Here's the thing that we learned in, uh, in our county. The folks who have mental health issues, they will walk in off the street for services. They will walk in when they are going into um, a crisis. And wouldn't we want them to walk into this facility as opposed to having someone come and arrest them and take them to jail? So this was a really um, big option for us. We couldn't fund it alone, and so we asked the city of Atlanta to help us fund this. So this is a, a, a partnership with the city of Atlanta. The other thing that we're doing is changing the narrative around what mental health looks like. And, it's not an ugly word, right? It's more of a health crisis, and we're trying to make sure that people, when you say someone has a mental illness, it is not seen as that person. It's seen as it's something that all of us should be cued into, and we certainly want to be able to, to respond to them. So we've started this campaign to really talk about mental health in a different, in a different way. We're looking for real estate right now, and so hopefully that center will be opening later this year. The next intercept, which is law enforcement. So one of the things that we've done with law enforcement is to commit as a business case to train 100% of all of the law enforcement officers who are touching the Fulton County Jail. That's 28 law enforcement agencies. <coughs> so a lot of people touching our jail. And so what we've asked to do is to have a tiered approach to training. We're giving CIT training, mental health first aid training, and trauma-informed training. All of the law enforcement officers are not going to go come off the street for 40 hours. And so each one of these have a different hour and value set to them, four hours, eight hours, or 40 hours, depending on where you are in engaging with folks with mental health issues. And then the second thing we're doing is creating a co-responder model, meaning that in Fulton County, and I know the folks from Georgia have heard this before, the 911 operators are your first line of defense. And what I mean, mean by that is that we've had several situations in Georgia where you get the, the 911 call and it says that there's a man who is on top of the building who is throwing shoes and he's naked. Now, that's a really good opportunity for us to think something is wrong there. And so the, the 911 operators now are going to be trained with the same level of training that we're giving the law enforcement officers on the street. So they start to cue into there may be an issue. I may need to send a different officer out, one that is trained in, with CIT or has some type of support for them so they just don't go out and, and arrest the individuals. And so we're doing that as part of Intercept 1. 
Intercept two, the initial detention and court hearings. So one of the reasons why we were not able to tell you how many people are um, actually coming in the jail that have mental health issues is because depending on what jail you, you go to or how your jail is set up, they're not doing initial screens to tell you if the person has a mental health issue. And so one thing that we wanted to do was to implement validated jail screens for 100% of the eligible defendants that are coming into the jail. That's that intercept for us. And so we do what we, um, what is a quick 90 second um, uh, correctional mental health screen. And we have it for men and women because believe it or not, the mental health issues for men and women in when they're incarcerated are different. And so this is also a free validated tool that we use. Here's the key, try to, try to reinvent the wheel when you have to, but when there are tools available to you, it will make this process much easier, including using the guide. And so part of what we did is we, we found the validated risk assessment tool, we started to implement it. It takes 90 seconds, 90 seconds to implement. And that is going to give us the ability to tell you that 60 to that 40 to 60 that I mentioned, we're going to have that number narrow for you. So the next time I present, <laughs> I'm hoping to have a firm number for you because we would have done the work to do that. The other thing that we're doing um, is uh, really trying to figure out this issue of imminent risk. How many people in your jails uh, are coming into your jail system, whether they have a mental health issue or not, are already homeless? already homeless. So when you release them, they're still homeless. They're still homeless, which means that they are of imminent risk and they are coming back. And so what we are starting to do at this intercept is trying to identify people who are, we consider to be imminent risk. They are homeless, they may not have connections to the community, and so we have to start the process of re-entering them. That means finding housing for them, finding medication, finding connections to the community so that we can keep them um, going. And then finally, our high utilizer project, which we talked about. Intercept three is jails and courts. Um, Mental health misdemeanor court, you all know about mental health courts, and so we won't go into that. That's done with our, with our um, magistrate court at first appearance. And then we have our special, specialized pretrial officers. Believe it or not, some people don't necessarily manifest all of their mental health issues in the jail, and, it start, and they are given bond, and they, they're put on pretrial. And what we're realizing is that pretrial officers are not equipped to handle those individuals who have mental health issues. And so we're specializing, we're training some of our pretrial officers in being specialized in mental health, and so they're going to be doing that at that intercept. Reentry. Reentry starts when you come into jail for us now. So at the point that we realize that you're coming to jail, that you're incarcerated, and that you're going to be released, we start to plan for your release date that day. And so we have reentry teams that are going to be in all, we have three jails. We have a main jail and two annexes. And so all of those um, intercepts, in this intercept, all of those jail locations have reentry teams. And then the final one is coordinated data. And this is the one that I'm most excited about um, because what this will do, we're creating our own integrated system where all of the service providers that touch our court system or our jail system will be able to come in and, and go into this system and see that Yolanda Lewis was at Grady last week. She might have been at the Fulton County Jail this week and she might be at the Housing Authority um, a couple of days ago. And they can go in and see every touch point that Yolanda has made in the county. And that will allow us to say, if I'm in Grady Hospital, hey, I just saw Yolanda last week. Looks like they were in your, your hospital. Can you tell me what the diagnosis is? And here's the reason why we did that. We had a call from a mother about uh, three months ago, and she said that her son had been in several different hospitals, and he had been diagnosed with at least four different conditions and he had medication for each one of those conditions. And so we not only lost him in the system, we perpetuated the issue because he now has four different, three to four different diagnoses and he's taken medication for several different concerns and he's in the Fulton County Jail.
and we're going to try to go through the process again. And so this data sharing process is going to allow everyone who is affiliated with that particular person or that high utilizer to figure out where their touch points are in the system so that we can provide better care for them. So that's what we're doing in Fulton County. That is six years of work. <laughs> in 15 minutes um, but if you have questions about what we're doing or if you have an interest in doing this in your own jurisdiction again Fulton FultonStepsUp.org is where we place all of our documents and we'll be happy to help anytime we can so let's thank both uh, Yolanda and Nicole Both Yolanda and Nicole have devoted so much work and energy to this work, and thank you all from uh, Georgia for being here. So we've got a couple of minutes. First, I want to make uh, two announcements. One, there are two workshops that are coming up in Flagstaff, Arizona in early August, and I've got Arizona right in front of me. Flagstaff in August is beautiful, right? Okay, so August 5th and 6th, uh, you can come to a workshop that will implement the guide, talk about how you do sequential intercept mapping, how you can get started in this area. There's still a few spots open. Uh, August 5th and 6th or August 8th and 9th. Again, Flagstaff, if you, uh, again, we've just got a couple of spots open. They're being sponsored by the State Justice Institute we're you know testing out uh, some new curriculum we're really excited about it email me uh, right away and I can send you the information so now that I say that let me make sure I've got oh I had it yeah there you go so my email address is up there so that's one announcement the second announcement is that the if you're not acquainted with the sequential intercept mapping, we do have a session uh, this afternoon on the NACOM agenda. It's at 2.15. It's called um, sequential intercept mapping. <laughs> <laughs> Look for it, uh, but we have Travis Parker from Policy Research Associates, and they'll do a tremendous job that will acquaint you with this. The guide that we're working on builds on the sequential intercept mapping, but we recognize, all of us in the court system, that it's more than the criminal justice system and the behavioral health system. We need to be looking at our civil justice system. We need to be looking at all of the opportunities that we have. So we're building on uh, the sequential intercept mapping, but please acquaint yourself with it. So those were the two important uh, announcements. We've got time for questions. Who has some questions for us? Yes. I'm curious about the Here you go. Here you go. I was curious about the pre-arrest it is? The uh, pre-arrest detention center, what exactly happens there? For how long is this sort of a preliminary yeah. assessment and you move them? Yeah, I'll, yeah. So, so when individuals are brought to the pre-arrest diversion center, they are um, given a, a intake analysis to try to determine um, what issues are going on with them. Um, there are also basic care, uh, basic care services there. So, um, general medical. Believe it or not, you know, folks have other issues going on, so we'll be able to take care of some of those issues. Um, we start to figure out their housing and their community connections. If they need um, medication, that will be available to them. But we won't keep them there for 24 hours. They can only be there up to 23, to 23 hours. We're not going to be an overnight facility starting off. Um, but we're leaving room to expand because obviously some folks will need overnight beds. Um, but it is, have you ever heard of um, the living room, which, which is a model I believe in Nashville and in Kentucky, Kentucky? It's, it's similar to that where it's an opportunity for us to start diagnosing what's happening with the individual, give them a place of respite, get them um, ready to go back out, but we won't be able to keep them overnight. And if they need medication, um, also transportation and things like that, we'll be able to, to work with them. Thank you very much. Other questions? Yeah. It was. <laughs> okay, I think that 
project. It's uh, <laughs> from Chicago. It's it's a big issue and uh, one that we have to pay a lot of attention to. I just want to make one one comment about it that I learned is if you divide the country between rural and non-rural, rural areas are probably struggling yeah. tenfold around these issues, uh, mostly because of resources. It's not unusual they have to drive an hour and a half to two hours for a sheriff yeah. to get a psychiatric evaluation. So I hope in your work you know, that somehow that's differential. Right. And as we mentioned in the as we mentioned in the beginning, it's going to take each of us in each of our communities, big or small, Chicago, Champaign, it doesn't matter, all of each community. So yes, we will be addressing it community by community. We've got time, yes. I saw that you have a misdemeanor mental health court, but what are you doing with your, uh, your felony cases and those with competency issues? Um, so, so uh, we have a felony um, behavioral health court, which operates like most of the behavioral health courts or mental health courts across the nation. Um, those are still up and running. The mental health, the misdemeanor, Mr. Mental, misdemeanor mental health court. Y'all try to do that. <laughs> um, is an addition in addition to the felony court. Um, because what we realized is that we had a structure for felonies, but we didn't have anything for misdemeanors, and so that helps with that piece. Um, we have talked about having specialized competency calendars and assigning those to a specific judge so that when the competency issues or, or people are restored, that they can immediately hit a calendar and they can have their cases heard at that time. We're still working to, to determine how to best roll that out. Um, what we are doing instead is uh, we've created a more of an electronic portal so that when individuals have to go and get a forensic evaluation, we get their forensic evaluation back through a secure portal at the court. And it comes like within seconds where it used to take weeks and weeks and weeks to get it back and get it to the right judge. And we go ahead and tell the judge on the date that we get it and they start calendaring. But we're really thinking about a competency calendar that is specialized for a specific judge. So one of the priorities of the uh, national initiative is in the competency area. Again, so many states are either in litigation or having struggles or will be in litigation over the inordinate delays of trying to find restoration treatment and services or even trying to get to the evaluation. So as we develop, we're, we're trying to develop some best practices in that, in the competency area. Another priority, and so we've got plans moving forward, um, so hopefully something by the end of this year. Um, another priority that's funded through the State Justice Institute National um, uh, Initiative is in managing court cases. We see the case flow management, whether it's on competency dockets, whether it's on criminal dockets, civil commitment cases, all needs to really come together and we need to be recommending some best practices in that area. Um, it's usually, it, not usually, it is one person with a mental illness, but they might have a case in the criminal, uh, on a criminal docket, they might be involved in a civil commitment case. We've got to be treating that one person with a, uh, with a mental illness and moving that case forward in the most effective way. My real goal is to not have case, many cases Cases filed. It's the first time as a court administrator I want to close the courthouse doors rather than open them and have clear access. So hopefully we won't get the, some of these cases filed in our courts, but if we do, we have to learn to manage them more effectively. So stay tuned. Do I have time for one more question? It's 11.15. I better uh, stay on schedule since we had a few other uh, technical problems. I apologize for that but I'm so grateful you were here. Thank you to our panel. <laughs>